Greetings, lovely humans, and welcome. A couple of weeks ago, when the temperatures in the UK got particularly chilly, I realised I was severely in need of a good winter coat, which I apparently do not have, so I thought I would tackle that today. I went digging through my vintage pattern stash and realised I didn't have any actual coat patterns, outer coat jacket type patterns, I managed to find through the magic of eBay a vintage pattern that I liked, and I pulled out of my stash this really cool grey and pink wool blend fabric. It's pretty hefty, and I thought it would be the perfect outer shell for a winter coat. So with my pattern and my fabric ready, it's time to get going. I started by tracing all the pattern pieces I needed for the coat pattern. If you're using a vintage pattern, you don't have to trace it, but as there were already a few tears in a few of the pieces and the tissue of this particular pattern was 72 years old, I wanted to do what I could to preserve the original pattern as much as possible. After all the pattern pieces were traced and cut out, I shortened the jacket and the lining pieces by about 5 inches and then moved on to cutting out. I wanted to lay out my lining pieces first because I wasn't quite sure I had enough of the lining fabric I wanted to use. This was a shirting fabric that Hamish gave to me because he didn't want it anymore and it was so soft I just I had to use it. I laid out my fabric and the back lining piece, then pinned it in place and cut the two back pieces out. For the front lining pieces, I needed to cheat a little bit. I didn't have quite enough fabric and I didn't want there to be a huge chunk of the lower edge of the front lining missing, but because the bottom edge was going to be turned up and sewn to the hem of the outer shell, it was fine for there to be a little chunk cut out of it. So I did a bit of jiggery pokery with the piece and figured out that the best thing to do was to place it very slightly off grain, just to minimise that missing chunk. And this is why it is always worth questioning the amount of fabric a pattern tells you it needs. The information for this pattern said that I needed three and a half meters of lining fabric. I cut these pieces out of one and a half meters of fabric. Now part of that is because this fabric was 160 centimeters wide, and part of it is because I'm short, so I shortened the coat a little bit. But like, had I just read the information on the envelope of the pattern and bought three and a half meters of lining fabric specifically for this project, I'd be pretty miffed at this point. So yeah, it's worth checking. No bad thing can come from checking, only good things. There is my cutting out wisdom for today, and I am going to go continue cutting out the pieces for this coat. Okay, I've laid my fabric out wonderfully, ready to go on the cutting of this front, when I discovered that my fabric, the edge of which is here, isn't... This is the thing. This is the thing about the jacket, sleeve, and cuff all being cut in one, is that it's really bloody wide. This pattern piece is 84 centimeters wide. This fabric is 150 centimeters wide. So clearly there is no way to cut the back piece oriented like this anyway. So either I go through the hassle of opening this fabric up after I very carefully made sure it was all lined up very nicely and cut each piece out individually trying to pattern match as best as I can, or I can cut it on the cross grain because the length of the coat from the very top corner of the shoulder slash neck down to the very bottom is 120 centimeters. And as I said, the fabric is 150 centimeters wide. So I could fold crosswise and cut at least my back and sleeve piece and my front and sleeve piece on the cross grain. So I unfolded my fabric, rolled it up in the other direction, and folded over the amount I needed for the back jacket piece. I decided to cut it on a fold instead of cutting it in two pieces because I just didn't want to bother with pattern matching at the centre back and wasn't sure I had enough fabric to do that anyway. Then I followed the same process of laying out the fabric, lining up the check pattern, 
pinning down the pattern piece and cutting it out with the front jacket piece. And I cut my upper collar piece and facing pieces out of any off cuts they would fit on, to be honest. Okay, so I paused cutting out for a little bit because I was getting quite worried about where the collar meets the facing and the front of the coat because this is pretty hefty fabric. This is how thick a single layer of it is. And if I cut both the collar pieces and the facings and the outer shell out of it, then I'm basically gonna have a place where there's four layers of this fabric sewn together with two of them folded back. There would end up being like a really hefty chunk of this stuff. So one, I think that would be really difficult to sew through, and two, I don't think it's going to sit very nicely or look very good. I was also pretty worried about the pockets and making the pockets out of this material, so I went rifling through my fabric stash and it turns out I don't really have any fabrics that are a decent colour match. But thankfully my partner Hamish is wonderful and has graciously agreed to allow me to use this grey fabric that he has in his stash to cut pocket bags and an undercolour for this jacket, as long as I don't take too much of it and leave enough for him to make a kind of linen shirt, t-shirty thing out of it. So I'm going to iron the bits of this that I need and do my best to cut out four pocket bags and an undercolour as sparingly as humanly possible using this fabric. So I quickly cut out my four pocket bag pieces and my undercolour and decided to call it a night. Okay folks, all of my bits have been cut out, so now all I need to do is iron the interfacing onto the bits that need interfacing and start sewing this thing together. The thing is, because this fabric is hefty, very hefty, I was really unsure that my very nice, functional, but very plastic modern sewing machine was going to be able to get through all of this because it doesn't really like chunky fabric and sewing through, in some places, four layers of it is not going to fly on that machine. It just so happens that recently I've acquired a few vintage sewing machines. Some of them have been given to me, some of them I purchased, and there was one that I have made in the 1950s. I started testing it out, tested all its tension, got it working, it was really lovely, and then noticed that after about 10 minutes of faffing about with the thread tension, etc., the motor started smoking. Not a good sign. It definitely wasn't an electrical issue, I just think there's a lot of dust that's gotten into the motor over the last 60 to 70 years and started getting a bit smoky with all the friction. Now I don't have the expertise to take that motor apart and clean it and I don't want to just burn the dust off because it might also melt all of the casings on the wires which are very important and necessary for, you know, the motor working and general safety. So I nixed that idea and instead I'm going to be making it on a very exciting, very special machine. It does not belong to me, it belongs to my mum, although I did buy it for her, so I suppose it's my fault that she has it, and it's a Singer Featherweight. People who are into featherweights love featherweights. They are obsessed with them, and they're like collector's items. I found this one on Facebook Marketplace, and the guy who was selling it used to run a sewing machine shop and just wanted it to go to a good home, so I went, and tested it and decided to bring it back to my mum and surprise her with it, with some help from my aunt, which was very cool. Oh my god. What? How did this happen? Oh my god. With a case and everything. Mm hmm. That's and even incredible. has its original <gasps> instructions and everything. Oh my god. This particular Singer Featherweight was produced at the end of 1947, and my pattern is from 1951. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to at least vaguely try to be one of those original practice babes and like use the materials and techniques of the time. So yeah, 1947 machine, 1951 pattern, it's a go time. Let's get sewing. Having already cut out any pieces of interfacing I needed, I used the iron to fuse them to the front and back facing pieces, as well as the sleeve facings and the undercolour. I got this lovely little machine set up with a fully loaded bobbin.
and I started sewing. I put together the lining first, just so I could get a feel for the machine on pieces that wouldn't be too visible, and tackled the centre back seam, the shoulder seams, and the underarm slash side seams. So I have just realised that I've done something wrong. When I was laying this out and shortening it, I thought that this mark, this point that I thread marked, was the top of the pocket bag. It is in fact the bottom of the pocket bag, and this is the top of the pocket bag. It just so happens that that is where I took all of the length out of this jacket, which means that my marks for my pockets are not in the right place. So I'm going to quickly fix that mistake before I press the seams on my lining and start sewing the outer shell. This is why sometimes it is worth reading pattern instructions before you cut your thing out, because I didn't do that. And I probably should have. And after unpinning, repinning and recutting that tiny bit of the jacket to fix that little mistake I'd made, I attached my under and over cobble pieces and sewed the back facing piece to the front facing pieces before starting on the main pieces of the jacket's outer shell, which was ultra speedy. I just pinned and sewed the two side seams and finished up with both of the shoulder seams. Okay, so we are back on day three of making this jacket, I think it's day three, and the outer shell has been constructed, or rather the two front pieces of the outer shell have been attached to the back piece, and I have pressed the seams. So now all that is left to do with our main jacket bit constructed and our lining bit constructed is to put the facings and the collar on the outer shell and put the lining in. I do need to do a little bit of figuring, however, about what I want to do with the closure for this jacket, because the closure that the pattern uses is linked buttons at the front neck, and the way that the pattern tells you to make the holes for those linked buttons to go through is to clip sections at the edge of the collar, turn the collar in between those two clippings, and then when the rest of the collar is stitched into place between the facing and the outer shell, you will have a little hole for your button to go through. I didn't trace the markings for that, and I didn't thread mark them, so I would need to find a way of correctly marking those points on this collar that I have now created, which is a bit tricky. And the thing is, I don't need to make the linked buttons to close this, I could instead use like a clasp or a toggle or something, but I kind of feel like the spirit of the thing is to actually make the coat that I have the pattern for, so I'm gonna try to do it. But I do think it would make sense, before I go through the hassle of like marking where I need to turn bits under to create the hole for the buttons, to figure out what buttons I'm gonna use, because surely if I want to use buttons that are larger than the hole that the pattern tells you to make anyway, I would need to adjust it. So I'm gonna dig through my button stash, because I'm sure somewhere I have like two buttons that are beautiful and I love, but I don't have another project that they would work on. I'm gonna go dig in. Five minutes later. All right, so I found some options for buttons. Three options, in fact. There are these, dark green, very pretty, but I think instead of introducing a new color into the mix, I would rather save these and use them on a project that demands dark green buttons. I have these kind of interesting faceted black buttons, but because they're black, I feel like there are more options in terms of using them in projects overall. And then I have two of these plain round metal buttons, which I think will look really good. And if I remember correctly, I actually pulled these out of some ancient sewing box I found in a charity shop. So who knows, they may in fact be off the era. I think we're gonna go for the little rounded metal ones. So I should get measuring and figure out if they're gonna work for the markings that the pattern gives me for the collar, for the openings for the buttons. Then we can get to sewing. Let's do the thing and get this finished. I did my best to accurately thread mark the relevant thread marks. Snip where I needed to snip. 
fold under what was to be folded under and stitch those two edges together. But because I was anxious about putting the collar in, I decided to just avoid it for a while and take on the rest of the jacket construction. Putting in the pockets was my next step, and it ended up being a bit of an arduous one, because the pattern instructed that the pocket bags be attached to the front and back pieces of the jacket after the side seams had been sewn, and with all the jacket I had to manoeuvre, how heavy that amount of jacket was, and how tiny the arm of the featherweight is, it was pretty tricky. I used long basting stitches to mark out the line to follow for my top stitching on the jacket's pocket opening, and top stitched that as neatly as I could. Before sewing the back pocket pieces to the back jacket, and attempting, with minimal fiddling and frustration, to sew the front and back pocket bag bits together. Then I could. Thankfully, finally, move on. I pin the sleeve facings in place, securing them with stitching. And because I couldn't avoid it any longer, I did a very sensible thing and basted my collar piece onto the jacket, pinning the facings over top, and got to sewing. I decided to just sew the collar in place first and tackle the front facing seams after, which was definitely a smart move because it made it easier to adjust some little mistakes at the outside edges of the collar, which I unpicked and redid about twice, before I moved on to sewing the front facings to the front centre of the jacket. Okay, I'm very pink, but oh well. So all of the seams for the outer shells and all the facings are done, all the pockets are in, which was the most irritating process. I have no idea what the person who wrote the directions for this pattern was thinking, but that was the least convenient way of putting in pockets I have ever experienced. Do not recommend. But oh well, it's done. That's the main thing. All that's left to do to finish this coat is put the lining in, but I am tired. And this coat is heavy. Like, my arms are literally aching from the amount of weight that this coat has, possesses, and from pushing that around all day. So I am going to go have my dinner and probably come back tomorrow to do the lining. Mother, what are you doing? See you later. Unhand me. How dare you? The next day. So I am back and I am further on than I was when I said goodbye last night because I couldn't sleep last night. So I got up and did some boring bits like under stitching the front facings and like turning in and pinning down the edges that need to be slip stitched before I can put the lining in. I didn't do the slip stitching though, so I'm gonna go do that next, sitting in comfort in front of the TV. And after those edges are slip stitched down, I can start putting in the lining, which is almost the final step. Almost. Puddle is having a great time. Yes. But unfortunately, I need to stop giving her attention. What? And go finish this coat. It was then time to begin the finishing. I turned under all the hems on the jacket's outer shell and used a large cross stitch to secure them down, pinned in my shoulder pads that Hamish was gracious enough to give me and fixed them in place with more cross stitches, then pinned in my lining and used a felling stitch around every edge. with essential supervision and company from the cats, of course. Do not block me. The people want to see me. I am very important, you know. Ooh, that's good. Hey, why do you stop? Is pinning? This may look relatively speedy on camera, but these last three steps took me about two days. What can I say? Hand stitching takes quite a while. But when I finally finished stitching the lining in, this 1951 winter coat was complete.
So there we go. My coat, my winter coat, is done. I'm really, really happy with it. It is very much my style. I think it looks absolutely great. There was a point just after I finished putting it together and finished putting the lining in that I was a little unhappy with how the upper back sat on me and was thinking that it might have been better if I'd, you know, done a mock-up and like taken a bit out of the upper back at the centre. But having lived with it a little bit and worn it, I think it's actually great that as a proper winter coat, I have enough space under that jacket to wear some really cosy, really bulky things. I also considered, just after finishing it, taking some of the scraps of the outer shell fabric to turn into like a belt so that I could tie it at my waist. However, again, after living with it for a while and wearing it and enjoying it, I don't think it needs a tie at the waist. I am really pleased with how it came out. It's incredibly cosy and incredibly beautiful. Using the featherweight to sew it was one of the most pleasant experiences of sewing I have had in my entire life, and I absolutely get why people are completely obsessed with them. I did have a moment of being like, is it wrong to murder my mother so that I can use this sewing machine more often? And the answer is yes, because obviously one, murder is wrong, and two, I'm pretty sure she'll let me borrow it whenever I want, so it's unnecessary as well. It's just a really nice sewing machine. So yeah, mission accomplished. I have a beautiful coat that I love wearing, and I had a really interesting time putting it together because it's put together in a very different way than anything else I've put together before. Like the super long sleeves with the sleeve facing that turns up to be the cuff, not a thing I've ever encountered before. Making little linked buttons, not a thing I've encountered before. The way that the collar was set in with pre-made buttonholes, essentially, not something I've encountered before. So I got to try a lot of really interesting new techniques, which meant I learned some cool stuff. Overall, big success. I hope you enjoyed my adventures going through this. I would really appreciate it if you subscribe to my channel, if you're not already, and if you are subscribed, that you continue sticking around, continue hanging out if that's your jam, keep an eye out for my next video. I hope everything's okay in your world, and I will see you all a next time. Yes. Jesus Christ. Are you all in here? This room is such a state right now, but I have too much stuff to do to take the time to tidy it properly. I'm not, I'm not having all of you in here, that's too stressful. So we're just gonna hide all of the mess out of frame. Camera magic. Oh, you are so possible. Camera lies.